a lot of our dear friends. <clears throat> Subject of my uh, discussion today is uh, loving interpretation of space. This I have borrowed from a very lovely poem of my most favorite contemporary Persian poet, Sohrab Sepehri. Um, in a poem called Traveler, uh, a traveler has come, has reached to the place, to the house of his host, and they are sitting, he's tired and exhausted from the trip, and they are just, they have a very relaxed conversation. And in, at the time of their discussion, he asked, what does beautiful mean? And he, uh, the other friend answers, beautiful means a loving interpretation of forms. Qashang yani ta'bir aashaghane asha. And because I'm architect and we deal with the space, so I'm using the, the word the space. Um, of course, you might ask that we have so many important things to discuss. There were discussion about genocide yesterday. I would really, I enjoyed Mr. Akhavan. Discussion, we have such mighty plan in our hand that we have to deal with. And why this confused person is talking about beauty, <laughs> loving interpretation. It sounds, I, I want to argue, my discussion is that, in fact, we have no other choice. This is what I want to mention in my talk today. That is our, we have to talk about it. We are bound to talk about it. We have been instructed to talk about it. And there is nothing more important than this to talk about. I will give references to that. This is dispensation of beauty. The name of God in this dispensation is blessed beauty, blessed perfection, ancient beauty. There should be a reason for it. In a prayer of Baha'u'llah we read, O oh my Lord, make thy beauty to be my food. too heavy for me. <laughs> you have to think about it. In a conference of architects in uh, School of Architecture in Yale, uh, two years ago, um, the subject of the conference was constructing ineffable, above material, building without material. Um, a very famous architect of North America, Mr. Musha Safti, referring to the gardens, to the shrine of the Bab and gardens, Baha'i gardens, said in his talk for the architects, most distinguished architects from all over the world, he said, it is so interesting for me that there is a religion in this world that the name of his God is Jamal, beauty. Then he said, Baha'is, have turned garden to the place of worship, to the place of pilgrimage. So interesting. And then he said how this inspired him to become an architect because he lived in Haifa and he was born in Haifa. This, uh, all of the um, talks of this conference is published in a book that you can buy from Amazon.com. It's called Constructing the Ineffable. It also has my lecture there that was about a spiritual space. And I have in full elaboration talked about the Baha'i faith and perspective of the Baha'i faith and many of the top topics that I talked tonight, today in that discussion. Constructing the ineffable. In a production of uh, Vision TV uh, that was um, uh, called Recreating Eden in an episode that was 
uh, about gardens of worship. About, um, I was asked in this uh, program, I was asked that, is this correct to say Baha'is worship beauty of nature? I said at the risk of being totally misunderstood, like what people consider Zoroastrian fire worshipers, I say yes. <laughs> because blessed beauty is the name of God in this dispensation, so we worship blessed beauty. We worship, we, we believe that seal of God is seen in the beauty of his creation. He has put his seal in form of beauty in everything. This is from Baha'u'llah in um, Hidden Words. O son of man, veiled in my immemorial being and in the ancient eternity of my essence, I knew my love for thee. Therefore, I created thee. Have engraved on thee mine image and revealed to thee my beauty. We recognize God the best proof of existence of God is beauty in nature, in everything, in everything. It's unbelievable, the beauty of creation of God. The most horrible thing that I don't like in my life is beetles. <laughs> beetles, I don't like. There is a museum of beauty of beetles. <laughs> you have to see how beautiful it is. It's unbelievable. This insect that I hate is so beautiful. <laughs> now we don't talk about the, the life under the ocean. There is a museum, uh, there is an um, aquarium in um, Dead Sea in Israel. It's very interesting. The being under the ocean, 20 kilometers deep in the waters, where there is no existence, nothing can be seen. The most beautiful things that you can imagine, all of them fluorescent lights. They have lights. It's full of, it's just like best, most beautiful firework of the world is happening 15 kilometer at the depth of the ocean. For no one. No one is watching it. <laughs> it's for, it is, seal of God because and only this ignorant idiot human being still argues that is God exists I mean how such kind of beauty can happen by accident beauty cannot happen by accident order cannot happen by accident but beauty that we are talking and in the Baha'i faith we are talking is not material it is ineffable. The word used is latif, letafat. The word latif in Kitab Aghdas is translated refinement. Letafat is translated to refinement. But in notes, note number 74, page 199, House of Justice explains that it is, this word has a wide range of meanings with both spiritual and physical implications, such as elegance, gracefulness, gentleness, delicacy, graciousness, as well as subtle, refined, sanctified, pure. Everything that is beautiful is in this world. And look at what Bob says about the beauty, about this subject. And whenever I use any quotation in English, I want to really give my thanks and my, really, I think all of us, we, are, we owe this to my dear friend, Mr. Nader Saidi, that we heard him last night for what he has done. It's so great in translating of the writings of the Bab 
to English. We have it in Persian Bayan. Revealed in prison of Maku, the most horrible, ugly place on earth at the time that the Babis were martyred in for Tabarsi. Bob took time to talk about beauty. Not only he took time to talk about beauty, he said, for in this religion, no other command is as rigorously enjoined as the duty of refinement. And it is forbidden that one brings anything into being in a state of imperfection when he had the power to manifest it in utter perfection. For example, he's talking about architects. Look at that. This is manifestation of God in prison of Maku. Nobody would know even what he, to, on this. He says, should one build an edifice? Should one build an edifice and fail to elevate it to the utmost state of perfection that is possible for it? There would be no moment in the life of that edifice when angels when angels would not beseech God to torment him. <laughs> Nay, rather all the atoms of that edifice do the same. <laughs> I said, I think if poor architects of the world, they knew, they knew this, they would have lost their sleep completely. Not that they sleep very well anyhow. <laughs> In Book of Asma, again, Bob says, educate then, oh my God, the people of Bayan, means all of us, educate us in such wise that no product is found amongst them save the very utmost perfection of industry is manifest therein. For verily thou hast desired by this law to build the earth anew. This is very interesting. Listen to that. To, to build the earth anew by virtue of thy glorious handiworks through the hands of thy servants. But he is asking, he wants us to perfect his perfect creation. And some of we say we don't have time right now, you know, it's, we have other priorities, this and that, this and that. Yesterday, I was, last night, I was talking to my dear friend, Mr. Tuman. We heard his music, beautiful. And I told him that you were too generous. You gave discount to the friend. You said maybe at the beginning of the fate, there was a time, uh, there was an excuse to say that uh, right now we don't have time, we have to establish the fate. Bob says, no, sorry. He was in prison. Godus was getting killed in Fort Tabarsi. And he said that there is nothing else that is. We have to do this. And we have, this is our duty. And I, at the end, I will say why he says that. He explains why. Again, in Persian Bayan, amongst the faithful of the Bayan, nothing may be seen. Nothing may be seen, except that it had attain perfection in its own station. Then he's generous. He says that, however, these are all binding to the extent that one possesses the mean to do so, not to inflict pain on himself. In perfecting things. For God loveth not to behold a believer in the state of grief, Rather, all are assuredly obligated to the extent of their capacity. But Abdul Baha takes that discount. He says, men who suffer not attain no perfection. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, to return to the poem of Sohrab Seperi, the traveler is talking to his friend, to his host. He says, why are you downcast? Why are you downcast? Are you feeling lonely? And how lonely do I feel? I think you are a captive 
of the hidden veins of colors. Captive that is enamored in love. And imagine how lonely would be the little fish where were it a captive of the blueness of the infinite sea. Imagine and imagine how lonely would the little fish feel were it a captive of the blueness of the infinite sea. What a delicate, sad idea. دوچار یعنی عاشق و فکر کن که چه تنهاست اگر که ماهی کوچک اسیر آبی دریای بیکران باشد Here the fish has become aware of the loving interpretation of water of the essence of water he has fell in love with the essence reality of water and has become captive and reality of the fish has become connected to the reality of water. And my talk is all about this captivity, this relation, this relation that is happening between the reality of things. In field of art and um, um, visual art, we are aware of four dimensions. There are three dimensions of length, width, and height. <clears throat> that we know. And also one dimension of um, um, movement was added to that later. They said that movement is in the field of, in, in the art. Picasso spoke about that and brought it up. So we, have, we know about four dimensions. Water in a glass has three dimensions. It has three dimensions, but it's not wet. Water in a river has four dimensions because it moves, but it's not wet. If we do not exist, water is not wet. Because wet does not exist. A rainbow Rainbow is water. Rainbow does not exist. You can never reach to a rainbow. You can never go through a rainbow. You can never touch the rainbow. It does not exist. It's in relation with light, water, in relation with reality of light and reality of a sky, and us becomes a rainbow. Rainbow does not exist if these four elements do not exist. But yet it's so beautiful. It's there. It exists. Now oh, we see it. It's there. But you can never go through it. You can never reach to it. I have tried once. <laughs> <laughs> but the art, the act of seeing a rainbow in this glass of water is art. An artist is a person who can see the rainbow in this glass of water. <clears throat> in my opinion, it is in the Baha'i interpretation of art, which is the loving interpretation of art, which the fifth dimension is interpreted by Abdul Baha. He, he explains this fifth dimension, this, this totally uh, the, the reality of things in necessary relations inherent in reality of things. He says that there is, everything has a reality. There is an inherent necessary relation between reality of things. It is not in our hand, you and me, and this building, and this light, and everything has a reality, and we all have relation with each other, whether we like it or we don't like it. We have this relation with each other. 
understanding of these re relations is what Abdul Baha describes later. I will talk about that. What we know in, in a good poet, a good architect, a good painter, a good musician, does not say that this is good, this is beautiful. Invokes the feeling. If the art is only three dimension, you have to talk about it. You have to say this is beautiful. Look, this is beautiful because it's like that. But in real, when it has become a real art, in the Baha'i interpretation of art, artist just creates a background. He creates a boom, a, a ground, invokes something that we can participate in that, and together we can make it beautiful. Together we create that. When we look at the paintings of, um, of uh, sunflower fields of Gauguin, uh, of Van Gogh, it's not only sunflowers. It's not, it's much more than pictures. It's, you can see the reality of wind, sun, lights, his feelings, his emotions, everything together in that painting. All together, it creates that beauty. Together with us, we create beauty. A Baha'i artist creates a mirror, puts in front of us, and we, our imagination, from our, the image, from the mirror of our mirror and his mirror together, it becomes an infinite, totally a new vision is created, which is really the loving interpretation of form. It's really the essence of beauty. It's much more really um, um, majestic and beautiful than, than what we really um, know. Um, this subject of relation and reality of things is very interesting subject in the Baha'i writings and really needs lots of thinking. Abdul Baha in Tablet of Hague, he says, talking about the, he says wise souls, wise souls. Yesterday we heard from um, Nader that uh, wise souls are intellectuals, are artists, are scientists, are scholars, are writers, are musicians, poets. The wise souls are aware of the necessary relations inherent in the reality of things. Definition of art, Abdul Baha says to us. Then, in Tablet of Dr. Forel, he says, talking about nature, he says nature is the essential properties and the necessary relations inherent in the reality of things. Then, in another place, talking about love, he says, love is the vital bond inherent in accordance with the divine creation in the reality of things. Then, in some answer question, he says, religion. Religion is the vital bonds inherent in the reality of things. The same understanding of the essential, necessary relations inherent in the reality of things. This is so. For the Baha'is, nature, art, religion. In another place, he talks about destiny. Destiny, he gives the same description. Destiny and art and intelligence are one. It's same. All of them have the same meaning. Look at the beauty of when we are talking about the most important, really, subject of the today and future in the world, in every field, will be protection of environment. In my opinion, the catastrophe that we are talking about in the Baha'i writings is environmental. Because atomic bomb and this and that, they are over. It's not going to happen. What will happen is destruction of environment. This is what we are saying. And the Baha'i faith is the only religion in the world that has clear, look at that. Look, I will read for you from Al Gore. The I mean, <laughs> best authority on protection of environment. He talks about Baha'is. Look at that. He says in, um, in his book, Earth in the Balance. He says, 
one of the newest of the great universal religions, Baha'i, founded in 1863 in Persia, warns us not only to properly regard the relationship between humankind and nature, but also the one between civilization and the environment. Perhaps because its guiding were formed during the period of accelerating industrial, in industrialism, Baha'i seems to dwell on the spiritual implications of the great transformation to which it bore fresh witness. Now quoting from Beloved Guardian, he's quoting. We cannot segregate the human heart from the environment outside us and say that once one of these is reformed, everything will be improved. Man is organic with the world. His inner life molds the environment and is itself deeply affected by it. Affected by it. The one acts upon the other and every abiding change in the life of man is the result of these mutual reactions. So look at what we have in this faith to use as the, for introducing the teachings of Baha'u'llah to the people uh, that today are so con concerned and so conscious about uh, um, protection of environment. So, I give you an example of um, architecture. Now, imagine, I want to give you an example from architecture. Imagine you are in a, uh, in a room, in a box, with six, with three dimensions. You have three dimensions. Um, the wall has all around you. But it is, it is a, um, it, there is no light. You can feel the space. You can feel three dimension. But it's dead. Space is dead. Now imagine we open one opening. The minute light comes in, the place becomes alive. You start thinking. You start imagining in the space. You can think. You can imagine what is behind that light, what is behind everything. And, and the space is really uh, gets um, um, a meaning. Now we can break the, the cube. We can break the box instead of having six uh, walls that block your view, block your uh, end. Uh, there is an end to die. Whenever you look at this, you hit the wall. You look at this direction, you hit the wall. You look at that direction, you hit the wall. You, if you see that the s spaces are going through each other, they are turning around, and there is no end to space, and there is light mysterious light that comes from different parts of the, uh, the dome. Here you see this is the, uh, 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 the dome of the um, uh, temple in India. Uh, you can see that the dome is intersection of nine um, um, sphere, nine dome turning into each, inside each other, turning around. There is no, no space, no surface ends ever. The surface goes behind another surface and disappears mysteriously, so that you can and light comes through. This is this is the type of dome that was uh, look at the, the in the Islamic architecture. But you, as you see, uh, what I wanted to show is that in the dome that I have designed, the, those surfaces I have opened the I have opened these um, uh, um, corners and light comes through. So it's there is no. Uh, I'm trying to just make it infinite, make it um, uh, so that the light comes in and it allows you to, to um, imagine more than what it is really, um, uh, what you could have seen only from two dim three dimension. I make it, I want, to, I, I want to make it five dimension. I go beyond the surface. The same thing, this is Haifa, this is my last building that I, uh, built last in, in Haifa, in um, Akka. This is Shrana Baha'u'llah in Bahji, new visitor center. Many of you have maybe gone there and have seen that this is a new uh, visitor center or pilgrim center that they go there. Wherever you go, every wall, if you see, there is a light here, there is a hello, there is a uh, 
this mysterious um, um, light that moves in the building like a spirit. And the reason is that, as you see, no wall, every wall is washed with light. Everyone, there is skylights that you don't see. It. There are, you, but it, they, they, they interpret the surface of every wall differently. So you can, and when you enter in, in, the, in space, you see there is no end to any wall. It's always, in, you can, you can you, there is a light here that is mysterious. And, uh, but you, you see that it's all effect of those skylights that they are, every wall has, is, is being washed with the natural light from, from above. There is a light in this flower, as you see, there is a light that is, um, it makes it translucent. It makes it, um, it, uh, it gives you a, 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 now here, it's not only the flower, it's light, it's water, it's um, whole uh, space together with you that makes this flower so special, so different from I think light in relation with us and with the, with the atmosphere can make any building ineffable, can make, can make space something that is uh, not from earth, is not material, it's above a material. And that is where we have to create, when we are talking about a spiritual space, you are not, the aim here is not to have a beautiful garden. The aim here is not to have a beautiful building. The aim is to have a spiritual space where uh, I, I say a spiritual space, beautiful space talks to your um, um, heart. A beautiful space talks to your mind, talks to you. A spiritual space talks to your spirit, to your soul. You, you get um, different um, I think God is in details. That is what I believe. God is in details. Beauty is this. You have to take a flower, take a flower and look at that very closely and look at the details, how the colors are merging with each other, how the details are. That is so important. This is a French uh, photographer that has taken photographs from kite. Look at the, by kite, I'm so, and how the kite have been, if you look, the kite, the camera is now standing right, right at the center of the building. Not one millimeter here and there. Not one millimeter here and there. And um, um, but then, um, and you can see that I have tried, I tried to reach to perfection. This building is plus minus three millimeter tolerance. The building that is 35 meters in some places, 40 meters high, it has tolerance of plus minus three millimeter. And because of that, when you look at, look at the symmetry, compare the distances with the, with the uh, pools, and you can see, look at how symmetrical it is. And it's, uh, it, it may not be needed. You, we can argue that it's not needed, but you know, I think it's, there is something interesting in details. You know, if you go to the top of the dome of the Shrine of the Bab, right at the top of the dome, where nobody ever goes. <laughs> if you go, it's only for uh, technical matters. I, I went up there because we were supposed to inspect the dome, uh, behavior of the dome and this and that. Maybe once every 10 years, I don't know. 20 years, somebody goes there to just check the things. Right at the top of the dome, there is a, there is a um, ventilation, there is a space for opening where you can go out, in fact, to, to the, out of the dome. The most beautiful, elegant detail, bronze detail that Mr. Maxwell has designed. When you look at that, you was wondering, why all of this beauty here? When it's not going to be seen at all. But you see, it has, I think it has, it released a power that makes that whole space, I mean, even if I had not seen it, I would have felt that power, that relation that it has with this 
the beauty and perfection that it creates. It creates that kind of a spirit that will touch our heart. We know something special. There was a beautiful story I heard recently. Uh, I mean, I heard about this uh, last uh, years of, after the revolution of Iran and um, suffering of our Baha'i friends. I was told that uh, there was in a small city, they were uh, possibility that they were attacking, they, were, they wanted to attack the Baha'i centers and uh, destroy everything and burn the books and all of that. And Baha'is were nervous and conscious about that, that why this is going to happen. And uh, they were talking to each other that, you know, what to do with the books, and they couldn't hide it somewhere. It would have been more dangerous. And one of the illiterate Baha'is that was there told them that I have a suggestion. He said, I have some life saving. You also can all, we can, let us all contribute. Build, buy the most elegant material. Cover all of these books. So when they burn, they are beautiful. I think there is a special power in this. It's really true. And um, people, we, we feel something, you know, we all, there is no dispute that a rose is beautiful. Everybody knows. I mean, whether you are a scholar or you are a, a construction worker or you are a laborer, what, whoever you are, you appreciate that a rose is beautiful. Now, an artist could explain it, why it's beautiful. Go to lots of, write a book about why a rose is beautiful. It's not important. The fact is that it's beautiful and everybody feels that it's beautiful. And the other one, the, the one that is not educated also, will feel that, has that feeling that it's beautiful. So this is really when you go to, you go to spaces where you don't know what is it, but you like it. Or you go to a place and you don't know what it is, but you don't like it. They have spent so much money, so much elegance, so much thing, but you don't like it. It doesn't talk to you. It doesn't touch your heart. That is what is really important in a building. Details. This is entrance of Taj Mahal. People, when they come to the temple, they respect it. From every religion they come, they, they respect it. But I think they respect it because it's, they like the beauty and they feel that spirit in the space. This is just an ordinary day. There is record of 150,000 visitors in one day. Here you see, this is the independent day of India. <laughs> this is the government. They have done it. And look at this. <laughs> Four major religions of India, Hindus, Buddhists, um, um, Christian, and a, um, a Sikh. Uh, they are carrying the temple as the symbol of unity of religions. Uh, Baha'is have had nothing with this. It's just themselves. So that is why I will tell you, this is right, this is an exhibition right now in city of Bangalore. Right now it is on, up to 10th of, uh, another 10th of September I think will be on. And uh, you see that how they have, this they have used Again, their own choice. They invited Baha'is and all of that, and they have made a whole temple with, with roses. It's, uh, I was told that three, uh, it's written that 300,000 roses have been used. This is the information center of the temple. To introduce the faith. I have to be fast, my time is getting over. Um, again, light and symmetry and proportions are the main concept of this design. Colors, 
details. There are almost 1,000 drawings for details. I'm just trying, I'm showing these things because I want you to think about the subjects that I mentioned and, uh, uh, and I have tried to really um, uh, use um, all of those ideas in this design uh, in different forms. Um, This is famous Saadi, famous poet of Iran, his grave. And I want to show that space of Shiraz. This is sh city of Shiraz to compare it because we wanted to have the fragrance of the gardens of Shiraz here, birthplace of the Bab. This is Maku, where in this prison, Bab spoke about that beauty and that perfection. and said there is nothing more important for us. And he said he didn't have one light at his presence and that's why we have flooded this mountain with lights in memory of his dark nights in prison of Maku. Details. Spend months to, this, to, to give this, this appearance to this fountain, to be crystal clear water, peace, not too much noise, not too much foam details. This is the shrine of Baha'u'llah, the new garden that was in front of that visitor center that I mentioned. Again, you see, it's just all creating. It does not, these are not real arches. It's not architecture, but it just gives you the um, impression. It's trying to create a palace with, in space. Gives you direction to the shrine. This is a garden in Shiraz. Um, I think um, Baha, as you know, Baha is the greatest name of God. And Jamal, beauty, Jamal, is reflection of God on earth in this dispensation. Reflection of God on earth in this dispensation. Loving if you can just I'm worried about this falling down, yeah. Um, loving interpretation of the world, really, Baha'is are trying to interpret this world lovingly, bring that perfection and that beauty to this world. And if, it is, if that perfection that we spoke about it in holy writing is reflected in our life and in our work, we do not need to do anything else. The masses of people of the world are going to become Baha'i by us, just the, the fact that they see that. Look at what Bob says in Persian Bayan, talking about the same perfection and beauty he says, should there be a faithful believer in the Bayan, in the far east of the earth, he would be beloved in his station. 
on account of his beauty and the beauty of all that he possessed. And this is the most mighty path, this, that beauty, who is the most mighty path for attracting the people of other religions to the true cause of the all-merciful God. So that is why I believe we have to think. We cannot say that right now is not time for perfection. It's the time for compromise. We have to just say, go ahead and do whatever we want. I think with whatever we are doing, if we consider that, if we consider perfection and try to make it as beautiful as we can, the result will be so majestic. And I think that is the task that our artists are really um, doing. And during these days of conference, we saw and we were so moved by all of the beauty of their work. And I was really honored to um, uh, be here. And thank you for your time.